Good afternoon. Uh, today we'll be dealing with X-rays of thorax and upper limb. So before moving on to the X-rays of thorax and upper limb, I'll, I would like to give a brief introduction to what is X-ray. X-rays are electromagnetic radiations. So uh, we, there are two types of X-rays. One is plain X-ray and the other one is contrast, contrast uh, X-ray. So in uh, plain X-ray, we don't use any kind of contrast medium and the X-ray rays are allowed to pass through the subject. So and in the contrast X-ray, uh, we fill up, the X-rays are taken after filling up the cavity or the spaces with the contrast medium. So this allows us to visualize the lumen of the viscous and also to assess the extent of the cavity. Now this is a plain x-ray. So what is radio lucent and radio opaque? So since this x-rays are allowed to pass through, have the ability to penetrate the body, some of the structures inside the body have the ability to absorb the radiations. Those appear as they, those appear white in color and they are known as radio opaque. While some others allow the x-ray rays to pass through them and those are called as radio lucent. Example is air. So an example for a radio opaque uh, structure is a bone. So denser uh, structures, they tend to absorb the x-ray rays, while lighter ones, they allow the x-ray rays to pass through them. So now we'll deal with the x-ray of thorax. So the first x-ray is plain x-ray chest PA view. Now what is PA view? So we need to know what is a PA view. So PA view is the one, is the image that we get when the x-ray tube is placed posterior to the subject. So here we can see the x-ray tube placed uh, posterior to the subject. So here it is placed posterior to the subject and the film sheet is placed anterior to the subject. And as you can see here, the patient's chin is lifted up. We ask the patient to extend the neck and the chin so that the image of the face doesn't come in the image field or doesn't obscure the image field. And the hands are placed on either side of the uh, hips on the posterior aspect so that the scapula is rotated off the chest and it doesn't obscure the lung field. So this is the PA view. This is AP view. So as you can see, the X-ray tube is placed anterior to the patient. Now uh, this, this AP view is taken in non-ambulatory patients and uh, in emergency cases. So we usually prefer PA view of the chest. Now when we start to read the x-ray, the first thing that we notice is the skeletal framework. So we know that the skeletal framework of the thorax is the rib cage. Now here we can see the ribs, the thoracic uh, vertebrae, uh, the clavicle is also visible. Now seeing the ribs, so here we can see the ribs and we can count the ribs. So this is a PA view. So here we can see the anterior end of the first rib is visible. So anterior end of the first rib, it appears to be broad. So that is how you identify the first rib. And from there, we can count the next rib. So this is the first rib, second rib, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh and eighth rib. So eight ribs, uh, the anterior view, uh, we were able to see and we have counted the ribs from the first rib. Now, uh, this is what we see here, the ribs. And here we can see the spine of the thoracic vertebrae. So we are able to make out the spine of the thoracic vertebrae. Now that is the skeletal framework. Next is soft tissue. So soft tissue, they appear slightly gray in color. So here we can see a soft tissue shadow here. So this is a shadow for, uh, made by the uh, mammary gland. So they appear crescentric, in, uh, they are crescentric and uh, sometimes the shadow extends beyond the diaphragm. Uh, so in those people, the uh, breasts are pendulous. That is why they extend beyond the diaphragm. Okay, so that is soft tissue and other soft tissue shadows that you can see is the axillary fold uh, in the supraclavicular region also we will see the um, soft tissue shadow. Now to study the viscera of the uh, thorax, we can uh, remember the mnemonic, very simple mnemonic so that you can, uh, you don't forget anything in the x-ray of the thorax. So the mnemonic is A, B, C, D. Now here A, A stands for airway, which is the airway uh, pathway in uh, thorax that is the trachea or the vein pipe. So here you can see the trachea here and the trachea as you know it divides into two bronchus. 
the right and the left bronchus. Now the point of uh, division is called as carina. So here the trachea will divide into right and left bronchus and that point of division is called as carina and it happens at the level of T4 vertebrae. Okay, so that is basically trachea. Next, we are moving on to B. B is breathing, that is uh, lung field. So, here we have the right lung field and here we have the left lung field. So, these are the two lung field and it is black in color. Why? Because there is air in the alveoli and the bronchi. And on the medial surface, that is the mediastinal surface of the lung, you can make out this white shadow here. Now, this white shadow is called as hyla shadow. So, that basically represents the hilum of the lung. So, in the hilum of the lung, we will find the pulmonary artery, the pulmonary vessels, lymph nodes. So, that is basically responsible for this hyla shadow. Next thing, C. C is cardiac shadow or the cardiac area. So, here we have the cardiac area and when you see the cardiac area, you should remember there are two borders for the heart, radiological borders of the heart. One is the radiological right border and the other one is the radiological left border. So, here the radiological light right border is formed of A. A is the superior vena cava. So, the right border is entirely venous border. B is the right atrium and C is the IVC. Please note that C that is IVC lies between the diaphragm and the heart. So, the heart and the diaphragm that is this region that corresponds to the right cardiophrenic angle. So, now this is a radiological border what forms the anatomical right border of the heart. The right atrium entirely forms the right border of the heart. So, there is a difference between the radiological right border and anatomical right border. Now, coming to the left border of the heart, the radiological left border of the heart, it is formed by the subclavian artery, the left subclavian artery, the aortic knuckle and here you can see C that is uh, the auricle of the left atrium and we have the left ventricle. As you can see here, the left ventricle forms the major chunk of the left radiological left border of the heart. Now, what forms the anatomical left border of the heart? It is the left auricle and the left ventricle. Next, uh, so one more thing to note in this uh, uh, x-ray of the heart is the aortic knuckle. What is aortic knuckle? Aortic knuckle is nothing but the shadow of the arch of aorta beyond the mediastinum. That is called as the aortic knuckle. Now, moving on, D. So, next is D. D stands for diaphragm. As you can see here, this is the right dome of the diaphragm. This is the left dome of the diaphragm. And you can see the right dome of the diaphragm is at a slightly higher level uh, because the right lobe of the liver underneath it push, its, uh, push it upwards. And here we have the left dome of the diaphragm. So, under the left dome of the diaphragm, we can notice a black shadow here that represents. So, under the left dome of the diaphragm, we have the fundus of the stomach. And in the fundus of the stomach, there is air. So, this represents the air bubble in the fundus of the stomach. Now, there are two angles that, is, uh, that are formed in relation to the diaphragm. One being A stands for the cardiophrenic angle that is it lies between the heart and the diaphragm and another one is formed between the ribs and the diaphragm. Now, that is called as the costophrenic angle. Okay, so there is right and left cardiophrenic angle and right and left costophrenic angle. Okay, so that finishes the x-ray of uh, thorax. Now we are moving on to the x-ray of upper limb. So the first x-ray in uh, upper limb is the AP view of right shoulder. So here we have the AP view which means the x-ray tube will be placed anterior to the subject. Now the order in which we are going to read this x-ray is one, first we will see the view, we will identify the view, second we will uh, identify the bones and third we will identify the joints. So First bone that you can see here is this one, the clavicle. This is the horizontally placed long bone in the body. So, first thing that you notice is the clavicle. Second in, we have the scapula and third, we have the upper end of the humerus. Now, this clavicle, it can be divided into a medial two-third and a lateral one-third. So, this point, this end is called as the acromial end of the clavicle. Now, if you see, the acromial end of the clavicle is articulating with this process here, which is called as the acromion process of the scapula. Now, below the acromion process, if you see, you will see a more or less a circular shadow here. That is the coracoid 
process. So the landmark is it lies below the lateral. So this is the lateral one third. It lies below the lateral one third of the clavicle. So that is the coracoid process and you might know coracoid process is an example of atavistic epiphysis. Now the next process of the scapula that you can see here is this the glenoid cavity or the glenoid process and to the glenoid process articulates the head of the humerus. So here you have the head of the humerus and here this is the greater tuberosity. The lesser tuberosity is not visible. So we have the greater tuberosity and the head of the humerus. Now coming to the joint we have already discussed this is the acromial clavicular joint. Here we have the acromial clavicular joint and here we have the shoulder joint. So this joint space here it represents the shoulder joint. So that is basically the AP view of right shoulder. Next we have the AP view of elbow. So before we go into the x-ray, this is a gross um, picture of uh, the AP view elbow. Now see here we have, so this is the medial end, this is the medial end and this is the lateral end. So here this is the lower end, this whole thing is the lower end of the humerus and here we have the upper end of ulna, upper end of radius. Now if you see here in this upper end of the, I mean lower end of the humerus, this medially placed, this uh, prominence is called as the trochlea which is pulley shaped and here we have the round capitula. Now above the trochlea we can see a fossa and this is known as the coronoid fossa. Above the capitulum this fossa is called as the radial fossa. Now coming to the upper end of the radius this is called as the head of the radius and this is the, uh, here we have the coronoid process of the ulna and this cavity here is called as the trochlear notch. Now this is the posterior aspect of the um, elbow joint. Here we can see a big cavity here. This corresponds to the olecranon fossa. Now to this olecranon fossa if you might notice you can see the olecranon process this is called as the olecranon process of the ulna articulates into this olecranon fossa. So this is the posterior view. Now we will go to the x-ray. Now we are going to see the x-ray. See this is the AP view of elbow. Now the first thing what is marked here is the olecranon fossa and coronoid fossa. Okay, so these are superimposed shadow of olecranon fossa and coronoid uh, fossa. Now B here, this is the medial epicondyle which is uh, prominent and is projecting medially while E here it is flattened and that is the lateral epicondyle. Now what we see here, C is olecranon process. So C is the olecranon process of the ulna but it has superimposed on the shadow of humerus. Now we have D which is the trochlea and uh, this is the joint space that is a joint space of the elbow joint. Okay, so these are the things that you can notice in the AP view. Now here this is again showing the elbow joint space, A being the elbow joint space. And other thing that you can notice here, this is the head of the radius and this is the radial tuberosity. Now you can see that the head of the radius and this radial tuberosity are partly overlapping the ulna. So these are the things that you can notice in a AP view elbow. Next is lateral view. So this is the lateral view of the elbow joint. So let's see how a lateral view is taken. As you can see here, the elbow is flexed to 90 degrees and the medial surface of the forearm and the palm is coming in contact with the film cassette while the thumb is pointing upwards to the ceiling. So this is how a lateral view is taken and this is the x-ray that you get, lateral view of uh, elbow. So see here also, this is a dry specimen as you can see here. So this is the medial epicondyle as you can notice it is projecting medially. Now this is the olecranon process of the ulna. This cavity is called as the trochlear notch. Here we have the coronoid process and this is called as the capitulum. This is the capitulum and you can see it is projecting beyond the anterior edge of the shaft of humerus. And articulating with the capitulum is the head of the radius. Okay, now we can compare it with the x-ray of the elbow joint. Now here we can notice A which is olecranon process, A is the olecranon process, B is the capitulum as you can see because the capitulum is projecting beyond the anterior edge of the shaft of uh, humerus and then we have C. So if B is the capitulum then obviously the head of the radius is going to articulate with the capitulum. Now D stands for radial tuberosity and E here we have the coronoid 
process. So that is basically the lateral view of elbow joint. Now the last x-ray, this is the AP view of hand. So here we can see first we are going to identify the bones. So here we have the lower end of the radius, here we have the lower end of ulna. So if you see the lower end of the radius, how do you identify? First we have to identify the lateral and the medial side. So to identify the lateral side, you can see the styloid process of the radius which is projecting laterally and the small head of the ulna and its styloid process. So that is one, that is one uh, way by which you can identify the lateral and medial side. Other method is by you can count the number of phalanges. Obviously the thumb will have two phalanges. So that is the lateral side. Now, so now we have seen the lower end of the radius and the ulna. Now we are moving on to the carpal bones. So carpal bones are arranged in a proximal and a distal row. So to name the carpal bones, we have to name it from lateral to medial side. Proximal and distal row, we will name it from lateral to medial side. Now you can remember this mnemonic. She looks too pretty. Try to catch her. To remember the order in which this uh, carpal bones are arranged. There are eight carpal bones by the way. So this is the lateral uh, side. So we will start from here. 1. S. Scaphoid. This is lunate. Then we have triquetral. PC form. So PC form is... It has an importance. So, PC form, it actually gets nurtured in a tendon. Okay. So, here we have the uh, PC form. It is a sesamoid bone. Now, we have five. That is trapezoid. Then we have trapezium, capitate and hamid. This arrow points towards one of the features of the hamid, which is the hook of hamid that is facing anteriorly. So, we have the hook of hamid. Now, we have named all the carpal bones in the proximal and the distal row. Now what we can see here is the metacarpal. So there are five metacarpals. Now moving on to the next view. So here there is a complete view of the AP, um, AP view of the hand. So here we have the metacarpals. Now these are the phalanges. So as you can see here in the thumb, there are only two phalanges while all the other fingers they have three phalanges. Okay. Now this that is, if you might see here, there is a joint between this lower end of the radius and the ulna. That is the inferior radiolna joint. Now, between this radius uh, and this uh, carpal bones here, we have the wrist joint. Okay. Now, between the carpals and the metacarpals, there is the carpometacarpal joint. And finally, there is interphalangeal joints between the phalanges. So, that sums up the uh, x-rays of hand. Thank you.